Naltrexone is an opioid receptor antagonist, and it's approved by the FDA to treat addiction to alcohol, opiates, and heroin. The dose to treat addiction is 50 to 100 milligrams per day, and at that dose, it blocks opioid effects for 24 hours. But the dosing for low-dose naltrexone is a lot lower, and that's between 1.5 and 4.5 milligrams per day. At this dose, naltrexone only binds partially to the opioid receptors. So this ends up leading to a temporary opioid blockade and ultimately increases endogenous endorphins. This is Dermatology Weekly, the official podcast of MDH Dermatology, where we bring you the latest in dermatology news and peer-to-peer conversations with clinical and research experts in the field. I'm the voice of MDH Podcasts, Nick Andrews. In this resident takeover episode, Dr. Daniel Missouri talks with resident Dr. Nadine Shabib about the benefits of off-label low-dose naltrexone for the treatment of inflammatory skin conditions. You can find the resident takeover portion of the episode after the news. This week in dermatology, it's key to counsel patients about what they can expect with non-invasive skin tightening procedures. And later, banning indoor tanning devices could save money, but it could also save lives. Remember, you can find links to the stories in the show notes, and you can find previous episodes of Dermatology Weekly wherever podcasts are found. There are robust show notes available for our resident takeover portion of the episode wherever notes are found in your app. We appreciate ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts, and we take your feedback very seriously. If you have suggestions for improvement, topic ideas, or guests that we just have to hear from, please email us at podcasts at mdedge.com. And now, the latest news in dermatology. We begin today with advice on how you can advise your patients about morning and evening skin protection routines. MD Edge editor Elizabeth Mishkati spoke with Dr. Brooke Sakura at the 2020 Skin Disease Education Foundation Seminar in Hawaii. We're here with Dr. Brooke Sakura of Skin Care Physicians. She spoke today about cosmeceuticals and she said there was a simple message to tell your patient about what to use in the morning and what to use in the evening. Yes, and I think it's, it's hard not only for our patients but also for other uh, doctors to know what to recommend their patients when there's so many options available on the market. So I try to really simplify it for patients when I'm speaking to other providers. They stress the importance of protecting and preventing in the morning. So we want to protect our skin from further sun damage and prevent further sun damage. And there's two key important ingredients that can do this. Uh, one of those is an antioxidant. So using an antioxidant-based product. And We know that antioxidants can prevent further sun damage and also protect us from both UV radiation as well as the harmful effects such as pollution, infrared radiation, and those other things that can contribute to extrinsic aging of the skin. We all should know, and I hope everyone is recommending that our patients use sun protection or sunscreen in the morning. Interestingly, not everyone knows that vitamin C is a product that should be used in the morning. Um, I find that amongst my patients as well as when I'm speaking to colleagues. So the reason vitamin C is so important in the morning is that it's protecting you from UV radiation and all of those other components that we're exposed to during the day. It's not as effective if you're only using vitamin C at night. For the evening time, I think that's the time where we're really doing skin repair. When we talk about skin repair, probably one of the most important ingredients, one of the most important cosmeceuticals that we can use or prescriptions is Retin-A or Tretinoin. If patients can't tolerate a retinoic acid, which is a prescription strength retinoid, then they certainly should be using an over-the-counter strength retinol. Uh, It's one of the most important ingredients that we can use as far as repairing the skin, stimulating new collagen, and helping with the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles. I have a question about that. So without naming any products, but you can get retinoids in something that's got the night cream formulations at night so that that... Correct. So a lot of people will use, it's hard because there's only so many products that you want to put on your skin and you're Mm -hmm. not going to want to put four or five, six products out in the morning or four to five different products on the evening. Uh, So there are some really nice combination products that are in the market. There are ones that will combine alpha hydroxy acids or glycolic acids with retinol. That's a nice combination. They're both working to improve collagen, fine lines, and pigmentation. You also have products that are more of an emollient base. So you have your retinol or your prescription strength retinoic acid in a more emollient base. And so it's not so drying or irritating for patients to use those formulations. 
in your discussion, you mentioned peptides and growth factors. What can Correct. you say about them? So I, I think the basic things, if anyone wants to stick with three important things, are antioxidants in sunscreen in the morning and retinols in the evening. If patients are looking to take their skincare routine to the next level and they really want to get some more benefit, you need products that are going to stimulate things in the dermis, so things that are going to stimulate collagen. And that's what growth factors and peptides do. And we have some beautiful products that are on the market now that have a lot of research and development behind them. These are things that are just going to further stimulate that collagen and really improve the wrinkles, in addition to using uh, your retinoids and those other products. Okay, and then two more questions, quick questions. With vitamin C, do the, are those included in some of these products for yeah, when you, you know, go out in the morning? There's a couple things that are hard to formulate. And so vitamin C is one of those things. It's a, it's a tricky thing to formulate. And so it doesn't always play nicely with other things. You know, it needs a very acidic pH to be effective. It needs to be in a certain concentration. So when it comes to vitamin Cs, you want to know what it's with. And so there has been data that has shown if you combine multiple different antioxidants together, they can double or improve their photo protection. But vitamin C is one of those things that if you were to just put it within a regular moisturizer, it's probably not going to be as effective because it's not really retaining the pH uh, where it can have the most, uh, most activity. But you can buy it separately. Correct. Okay. Exactly. And then my last question is, with the sun protection factor in like the creams and your foundation, that's not enough, right? Or that's what I always wondered about that. Yeah, I think it's, it's not a bad idea. I get in the habit and, and I think order does matter. So I tell patients serums like vitamin C's go first, if they need an additional moisturizer second. And I really stress the importance of using an actual sunscreen or a sunblock third. And that should be the third thing that you're applying in your routine. We know we want them SPF 30 or higher. We know we want broad spectrum. Um, we do need to be re reapplying. Obviously, when we're indoors all day, sunscreens break down slower because we're not out in UV light. Whereas if we're at the beach or at a, an event outside, they're going to break down faster. So you have to apply more regularly. But I do think it's important that you're using a separate sunscreen that really is intended for that purpose. We don't always have enough in just our makeup or in just our, our primers. SDEF 2020 is put on by the Global Academy for Medical Education, GAME, and this news organization are owned and operated by the same parent company. And it is important to counsel patients about the degree of improvement they can expect with non-invasive skin tightening procedures. This is according to Dr. Nazanin Saidi, who spoke at the 2020 Skin Disease Education Foundation. Dr. Saidi spoke with MDH editor Elizabeth Meshkadi once again from Hawaii. In my talk, I was discussing what's available in 2020 and what can be done non-invasively. And we have so many different technologies available that can help with skin tightening, but it's very important for us to be aware of what we can expect and what we need to do in terms of patient education. Patients really need to be aware that we can provide mild to moderate improvement in skin laxity, but we can't replace a surgical facelift. These treatments have minimal downtime. Some of them have no downtime, but it's not gonna replace going under the knife and having surgery. One thing to keep in mind is educating patients so that their expectations are met. In a recent study that was done by Ann Chappas' group in New York that was published in LSM, they talked about how important it is to set patient expectations because when they had done a review of 459 treatments, they found that 80% of the patients had improvement, 20% of the patients had no improvement after receiving microfocus ultrasound, but what was important was that only about 50% of the patients were satisfied with their treatments and only 40% thought that their expectations were met. If we spend enough time initially counseling patients and reviewing what to expect, I think that we can really increase patient satisfaction with these treatments. And you can read more from Dr. Sadie by clicking the link in the podcast notes. Finally today, banning indoor tanning devices in the U.S., Canada, and Europe could prevent nearly half a million melanomas and nearly 10 million keratinocyte carcinomas. This is according to the results of new data published in JAMA Dermatology. In the study, the researchers found that their model projected nearly 90,000 fewer deaths from melanoma, which would result in saving more than 400,000 life years. 
They also investigated the financial savings. Researchers involved in the study also reported that a ban would save nearly $6 billion and would result in productivity gains of more than $41 billion. The authors noted that indoor tanning is regulated in more than 20 countries. Indeed, Australia has instituted a ban on commercial indoor tanning devices, and Brazil has banned both commercial and private tanning devices. In the U.S., 19 states have banned the use of indoor tanning beds for minors, while 44 states and Washington, D.C. have some regulation of tanning facilities for minors. Compared with the ban on indoor tanning for minors, the benefits of a full ban on devices were 3.7-fold higher in the U.S. and Canada and 2.6-fold higher in Europe. And that concludes the news portion of this episode of Dermatology Weekly. Remember, you can read more about any of these stories by clicking the links in the show notes. Coming up after the break, it's time for our resident takeover. Welcome back to Dermatology Weekly. I am Nick Andrews. It's time now for our resident takeover with Dr. Daniel Missouri. Today I'm talking to Cutis resident corner columnist Dr. Nadine Shabib about low-dose naltrexone, a hot topic in dermatology that she recently covered in her column. Dr. Shabib is from the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics in Madison, Wisconsin. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Shabib. Thank you for having me. So to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about what naltrexone is and how its off-label use in dermatology compares to its approved indication? Yeah, so naltrexone is an opioid receptor antagonist, and it's approved by the FDA to treat addiction to alcohol, opiates, and heroin. Um, The dose-to-treat addiction is 50 to 100 milligrams per day, and at that dose, it blocks opioid effects for 24 hours. But the dosing for low-dose naltrexone is a lot lower, um, and that's between 1.5 and 4.5 milligrams per day. At this dose, naltrexone only binds partially to the opioid receptors. So this ends up leading to a temporary opioid blockade and ultimately increases endogenous endorphins. Low-dose naltrexone, which you might hear me refer to as LDN, Its anti-inflammatory effects are by blocking non-opioid receptors. So naltrexone blocks toll-like receptor 4, which is on keratinocytes and macrophages. And these macrophages contain inflammatory compounds like tumor necrosis factor alpha or TNF-alpha and interleukin-6. So ultimately, low-dose naltrexone can suppress these inflammatory markers, which is how it works in some inflammatory skin conditions. And these anti-inflammatory effects aren't seen at the higher doses of naltrexone. They're only seen at the lower dose. That's really interesting. And it makes me curious about how these dermatologic benefits and anti-inflammatory effects were first discovered. Do you know how dermatologists first came to think about low-dose naltrexone? Yeah, so in October of 2017, there were a couple of case series that were published in JAMA Dermatology, and each one covered a few patients with Haley Haley disease that were treated with LDN. Um, in one of them, they noted that patients had discussed LDN on social media platforms like YouTube, but that there hadn't previously been any published evidence for it. In addition to case reports on Haley Haley disease, Do you know what other dermatologic conditions have been reported to benefit from low-dose naltrexone and what the level of evidence is for these conditions? So at this point, the level of evidence is mostly case series and case reports. And some of the other conditions, aside from Haley Haley, include lichen plano pilaris, psoriasis, and then also various causes of pruritus as well. At my program, one of my attendings has used low-dose naltrexone for paritis that's idiopathic. What's been your experience treating any of the conditions you mentioned or any others with low-dose naltrexone? So at our institution, um, one of our faculty, Dr. Apple Bodemer, is fellowship trained in integrative medicine, and so she really commonly prescribes low-dose naltrexone as some of our other faculty. So some of the commonly treated diagnoses include psoriasis and lichen planopilaris. Also in some other conditions, 
that we use LDN for include paritis that has had a negative laboratory workup, that's failed topical treatments, um, and other systemic treatments, for example, like phototherapy. I've also seen it used in patients who have had negative patch testing, but still complain of paritis or of a burning sensation without really a clear underlying cause. Finally, we also use LDN as a treatment option in patients that have contraindications to other systemic anti-inflammatory treatments. So for example, in a patient with a history of malignancy, we would want to avoid a biologic agent. Or in a patient with a history of high cholesterol levels, we may want to avoid acetretin. So it seems like the underlying conditions where low dosotrexone seems to be used have some kind of either paritic component or inflammatory component, and maybe a kind of special area where it comes into play is in patients who have contraindications to on-label treatments for those conditions. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So with that in mind, and especially considering that some of our listeners may not be familiar with low-dose naltrexone, what are some of the side effects that they should be thinking about, telling their patients about, and have you come across any tips for minimizing these side effects? So I think another benefit of low-dose naltrexone is that it has a favorable side effect profile. One of the more common side effects is sleep disturbances with vivid dreams, and that can be seen in over a third of patients. And a tip for decreasing that side effect in patients is by having them take their low-dose naltrexone in the morning instead of before bedtime. Another commonly seen side effect is gastrointestinal upset. And finally, there's also a possible side effect of altering thyroid hormone levels, especially in patients that have a history of autoimmune thyroid disease. So for those patients or for any patient, because of the potential side effect when it comes to the thyroid, are there any labs that should be checked and at what frequency should they be checked? If they haven't had a normal TSH in the past year, then you can consider checking one at baseline and then to check every three or four months for patients who do have a history of thyroid disease while they're on treatment. I'd also recommend counseling patients about symptoms related to hyper and hypothyroidism so that they're aware of symptoms to look out for. Thyroid disease aside, when it comes to the side effects that you mentioned about sleep disturbance and GI upset, do those tend to linger or kind of self-resolve? And if so, what's the, the time course that patients should be told over which those, you know, tend to get better? So in the majority of patients, the side effects resolve within um, a few days of starting the low-dose naltrexone. Okay, great. Something else I was wondering about, considering the fact that naltrexone, as you said, is indicated to treat addiction, we have an opiate crisis happening right now, and also that, you know, for first-time prescribers, this may be the first time that they're entering the opiate and opiate uh, receptor antagonist arena when it comes to pharmacology. What would you say to prescribers and or to patients who may be concerned that being on low-dose naltrexone runs the risk of addiction or has any potential for that? There is no known abuse potential for low-dose naltrexone. But that being said, if it's taken with an opiate, it can cause withdrawal symptoms and also decrease the effectiveness of the opiate. And if it's taken with other opioid blockers, there's also a higher risk for opioid withdrawal. So before prescribing LDN, it's important to ask patients if they are using opiates or any opioid blockers. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think another thing to reiterate is that low-dose naltrexone and naltrexone in general is an opiate receptor antagonist, whereas other kind of medications in this family may be opiate agonists. And so when we're talking about low-dose naltrexone, we're talking about opiate antagonism, not agonism. Along the lines of there being no known abuse potential, when it comes to being on low-dose naltrexone and, for example, wanting to discontinue or taper off, do patients need to be tapered off or kind of how does that work? 
Low-dose naltrexone does not need to be tapered or weaned, so the patient can stop taking it when they decide with the provider that they no longer are going to take it. And then from a practical perspective, what should dermatologists know about actually prescribing low-dose naltrexone if they want to do that? And what should they tell their patients in terms of cost and insurance coverage? So some things to know, you don't need a DEA number to prescribe it. The prescription will need to be sent to a compounding pharmacy. And it's not FDA approved for any dermatological diseases, so the cost won't be covered by insurance. At a compounding pharmacy in Madison, Wisconsin, which is where I'm training, it ends up being about $30 a month. So that's something that I would counsel patients about, and there may be a little bit of wiggle room in that depending on the city that you're practicing in. And in the New York area where I go to residency, one of the compounding pharmacies that we work with sells a three-month supply for $40. So, um, you know, the price can vary like you were saying, and I think just reaching out to whatever compounding pharmacy you like to work with and seeing what they have available is the first step for anyone who's interested in prescribing low-dose naltrexone. So with that, Dr. Shabib, do you have any final take-home points for our listeners? Low-dose naltrexone is an alternative treatment option with a favorable side effect profile, and it can be considered in patients with different inflammatory skin diseases. There's a lot of potential for the conditions that we've already discussed, potentially with other inflammatory skin diseases as well. But more data is needed because what we have now is limited to case reports and case series. And that's it for this week's episode of Dermatology Weekly. Don't forget you can find previous episodes wherever podcasts are found. Be sure to catch every new episode of Dermatology by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen. For all of us here at MD Edge, I'm Nick Andrews. You're listening to Dermatology Weekly.